Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, your audiobook reviewer, and today I will be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. I will be beginning with Asgard Awakens, the Veilverse Asgard Awakening Book 1 by Blaze Corvin, narrated by Andrea Parsno, with a book length of 9 hours and 8 minutes. Stars twinkled amidst the inky vastness, handfuls of glittering sand thrown across the darkness of infinity. The uncaring vacuum of space was remorseless, offering no warmth or safety, but the traveler remained untouched. Ages had passed. The traveler had not spent much time actively thinking for quite some time. All that remained had been a single purpose. A single destination, all driving towards one thing. Hope. Despite traversing the void for an eon, the bodiless entity had never lost focus. Revenge and knowledge, the ancient drive still remained strong. The traveler should have stopped existing long ago, merely dissipating into the cosmos. But the hope born from forbidden knowledge still burned, combining with an iron will to create energy from nothing. I'm going to be breaking this down a little bit differently because I will be reviewing Cultivating Chaos right after this. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to bunch up Andrea's narration onto the second book for reasons. Uh, it's just simpler to just say what I thought about both books at one time rather than splitting it up. It kind of It's kind of silly to do that. Um, so that's why it's going to do that. First of all, kudos to Corvin and William Moran. Uh, for having the balls to try to pull something like this off. We now seem to have a Lit RPG audiobook, or not audiobook, just a Lit RPG Thieves World type universe. Uh, you know, that, that was an old shared world uh, that came out way back in the early 80s, and it ran for a long, long time, uh, where, you know, authors were invited to come and play in a certain sandbox. And Thieves World was a really interesting place. It wasn't always magnificent, uh, but there were days that it was totally brilliant, and there was times it was just total trash. But that's because it was written by a multitude of different people. They just had rules. This is the world. This is the way things work. Um, come join us. And and I could actually see the Veilverse really kind of becoming like the little RPG uh open gaming session kind of thing. It's kind of like, you know, come play D&D, but you get to create your characters, you get to create your world, you get to create everything, but it's just here in Veilverse, and it's all interconnected. Uh, I, I would love to see, I mean, honestly, uh, I think all you guys have, like, this great connection with each other, and I'm only going to spit out some names. I'm, I'm not saying, if, if you weren't named here, it is not a slight in any way, shape, or form. I do not mean to cut anybody out these were just like the first couple names that came to my head as I was thinking about this. But like, for example, Dakota Kraut, James Hunter, Dave Wilmorth, MSE, even Harmon Cooper getting into this playground would be amazing. It would be amazing. Or none of them. Or none of them. It could just be Blaze Corvin and William Moran and left at that. But this is just like a really exciting, I mean, I can't tell you, this is like a really exciting brilliant idea uh the veilverse itself is just about various worlds that are connected by like these dimensional shifting curtains where reality sort of wears thin people can cross over through these curtains and interact in new worlds um, here the main character characters in both books come from earth although the main character could come from anywhere in the veilverse if you, you really want to you could have a character that comes from asgard and goes into you know, Neverland it, it, it's just the way it works. Um, so it doesn't have to be everybody comes from Earth. But it's it's pretty smart the way they do this. Uh, although Corvin's character is sent to Asgard. So let me kind of uh, center this on Blaze's stuff more than the, the brilliance of the, the concept itself. Because the concept is pretty overwhelming. And I think it overshadows whomever I talk about after all this, because it, it is, a, it's like a tidal wave of possibilities. And I would love to see them extend out some, some invitations for other people to come and play. I really would. Um, now, in 
the Asgard Awakens book, uh, there is a guy who is given the mantle of Odin, and he slowly grows into his role as a new god. This guy is Trav, and he seems to have had some horrible things done to him as a slave. Uh, we first meet him as he is in the underground mines, uh, and he's just kind of doing his thing to keep people from being killed by these horrible overseers called the Kin, and he ends up having to not only keep the Kin off of the people's backs, so to speak, in the mines, he's also got to keep the predatory humans who think they're, you know, able to get away with things just because they're bigger and stronger than other people, he's got to keep those people away from the weaker people as well. And he's well loved for what he does. Um, but what happens is there is, of course, a point where he has to leave the mines because you can't have a book about a guy who's a slave in the mines for nine hours. It just would not work. Well, that's not exactly true. I think Blaze Corvin, if anybody could make it work, Blaze Corvin probably could. Um, you know, I think uh, Piers Anthony did it years ago, and I can't think of the book. Uh, but it was all about a guy that was in, in a, on a planet in a mine for years and years and years. So you can do it. You, you know, you can do it. Um, but, but here, I think that you really kind of had to get outside of the box, so to speak, and, and let his character Trav grow and develop. Um, so what happens is, is uh, Odin kind of recognizes Trav as he is passing through, you know, space and realizes that he can pass his mantle on to the boy uh, and save his life at the expense of his own. And, you know, he kind of decides to do this. So he passes on everything about himself to Trav, but without being able to tell Trav anything about what's happening. Uh, you know, for a long time, Trav has no clue why he knows what he can know, uh, why he can do the things he can do. He just knows he's stronger. He's able to do better things than most people, that sort of stuff. And and what happens is, is the kin basically prepare to destroy everybody in the mine and he has to escape or die. And that's pretty much the impetus for the whole book. Um, once he does that, things really start moving along quite nicely. It was, it was, it was a pretty good bump, but a dump, 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 nonstop. Here we go. This is going to really take the cake because it got really interesting right after he left that cave, you know, um, basically, he, uh, he, he gets his escape and he finds that he grows his power by, um, how do I put this? Binding women to him as he goes along. Uh, basically, he is making Valkyries by doing things, uh, you know, by, by tying them to him. He takes their power for himself, makes them stronger. He's stronger. It works out well for everybody involved, but he's only got so many slots that he can, that he can hand out before it'll either kill him or, you know, backlash him to where he can't do anything else. So he has to be pretty smart in what he's doing. And, and that was like the one aspect of the book. I was like, kind of like, what, 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 what's going on here? I can't, I can't understand this because it was like for a little while, every woman he ran into, he ended up binding to himself. And I was like, well, you've only got so many slots you can bind people, but you're the first three women you meet, you bind them, <laughs> you know? So it, but it was just kind of funny because this is, um, this is it, this is kind of like Blaze Corvin's foray into harem, and it was funny because uh, I say that because he's not real big into the harem stuff, and I don't think I've ever seen him really do anything along these lines. And uh, William Morand is the harem dude, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, he's right out there, you know. He is. He's. I think everything he's done so far has had harem aspects to it, um, and Blaze kind of steps up and, and goes a bit further than William does uh, here sometimes. Uh, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. Um, but, it, you know, the book evolved into a lot of things because it started off looking like it was going to be just a typical I need power to get revenge. But it, it just kind of just grows into a whole lot more than that. Um, so I'm not going to complain. Uh, and my only problem is I'm still waiting on Delvers. Still waiting on Delvers. But as long as books like this keep popping up, I'm not going to complain. Not not going to complain at all. Well, I might have much, not much, because I'm still waiting on the Luxstat part two, and I'm still waiting on Delvers part two, and uh, you know, there's a lot going on. And and I know Blaze is a self-proclaimed slow writer, uh, 
although he's a self-proclaimed slow writer, he is an amazing writer, and I'd rather he take his time doing what he needs to. But this is like one of those series where now, and this is he, he's what he's doing now is he is basically pulling a Dakota crowd on me because crowd has, uh, you know, this series and that series and this series, and you're just like. I want this one. I want this one. I want this one. I want them all now. And he's doing that to me because, you know, he's, he's got Nora Hazard. He's got Delvers. He's got this bouncing him around. He's got Luxstat trilogy. I mean, stat, Luxstat strategy. Um, he's got all that happening and you want him to focus on this. But if he does that, he takes away from here. So, you know, he, he's kind of put me in a bind as to, Here's what I want. And, you know, you can have your cake, but not eat it. And, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it, too, because if you eat it, you no longer have it. So um, I just have to say he's got to get the stuff done and and do it on his schedule and do it right. Uh, I'm not going to scream at the guy for making me want to read more of his stuff. That would be silly. But Corvin certainly crafts um, a great story that populates his world with interesting powers, people, and prices. I don't think that um, anything that Trav does doesn't come without a cost to him or somebody else in one way or another. And it, it, it's just one of those things where you get to see him struggle because he grows in power. And the more he grows in power... Uh, he he gets to be concerned because he needs he needs more power, but not for the same reasons as he did at the beginning of the book. Like I say, in the beginning of the book, it was more of a revenge story. Um, his his wife is killed, and he wants to get revenge on the person doing it. Uh, as we go through the story, there's a heck of a lot more happening, and he ends up needing more power to do things that need to be done to help people, save people himself, the people he's with, that sort of thing. So he needs all this extra stuff. And and he kind of flips it where he's like, well, I, I you know, I do want to take care of this cat that hurt my wife. But at the same time, I, I have all these other things I'm responsible for and I want to take care of them. And he, he begins to see the, the inherent dangers of what's going on because he's not the only person like himself as we go through and find out. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things where every time something is revealed, um, it, it, it not only makes the story elevated, but it also digs a hole for the character, for Trav. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of found funny was Trav literally spends time worrying about his cousin Ash way more than I think Ash worries about Trav because I, I didn't get a chance to count them, but if you, you would set them side by side and see, I think there's probably like four times where Ash is like, Oh, I wonder what's up with Trav. And Trav is like my cousin, Ash, my cousin, Ash, my cousin, Ash. He does it a lot. And and it's, it's crazy because this book is like nine hours and the other one's like 14 plus minutes, you know, 14 hours plus some minutes. So it's a lot longer. And, and, and there's less mention of the cousin in the one book than the other. And, and that's fine because I know if, if it had been me, and I wouldn't be worried about my cousin either. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, he's fine or he's gone. I don't know. Um, you know, my only possible complaint with this book is that it is shorter than Cultivating Chaos. Uh, like I said, Cultivating Chaos is about 14 hours long. This book is only nine. Okay. Uh, I need more. But at the same time, I know Blaze is a slow writer and it was killing him to get this done. I'd rather have it done well and ending well in the right spot than having it be forced. So I think that it was fine. But like I said, if I had to complain, I just complained that there wasn't as much as the other book. Uh, because this was like a really great, interesting book. Um, I don't know how to put it any other way. I, I, I enjoyed every second of it. It's very interesting. It's got a neat new magic system. Uh, I like how he interacts it and makes it lit RPG, how he adds the lit elements to it, um, which is is pretty slick. I, I think that he did a really good job on that. Uh, so I think that uh, you'll enjoy the way he, he portrays the magic use, the magic system. 
everything is really well thought out. It's very well thought out. Uh, so, like I said before, at this point, I would normally talk about Andrea Parsno's involvement in the story, but I'm not. I'm going to move ahead and do Cultivating Chaos in my next segment. So, for this book, uh, I want to give it 8.4 stars. It is smooth like Lagafin whiskey. Uh, it is pretty smart. It's got good characters. And I, I like the harem building that he does. I know it's not his forte. And I think that he pulls it off. I think he does well. And he maintains um, integrity throughout the book. And it's not like you just feel like it's a harem to be a harem. It is It is one of those things where it, it all makes sense. It's all logical. Uh, the only question I had was, was I know the first lady who he binds to him, um, she's kind of beat up. Like her teeth are all snarled and stuff like this. And he talks about how good looking she is. And I'm thinking, man, to me, she came across as being described as Two-Face from like uh, Batman. You know, Harvey Dent all mangled up on one side and all. Uh, but maybe I just, <laughs> maybe I ran a little bit too much into it. Uh, I'm sure I did. But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that beauty is, is not inherent in somebody just because of their, their appearance. Uh, I think that I'm just over, overstating it just a touch just for dramatic purposes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, there's a lot of lessons here that, that Blaze teaches us about characters. Uh, and, and the first one is, is that, uh, the main character here, Trav, pretty much, much accepts people for who they are. Uh, without question. And he, he, he works with them and helps them as best he can to fulfill who they are. And that's pretty smart. So 8.4 stars, and we'll get to the next one here in just a second. Okay, so if you've been paying attention, you know the next book I'm going to be doing is Cultivating Chaos, Delverse Cultivating Chaos Book 1 by William D. Aran, narrated by Andy Parsnow with a book length of 13 hours and 16 minutes. Ash sat down in the ruined building, crossing his legs underneath him. Looking around himself, he found it was the same as ever. Two walls, shattered columns, and a whole lot of nature quickly taking over the destroyed structure. He was only about 30 minutes out from the small city in which he lived, and yet it felt as if he were light years away, as if there wasn't a single hint of his life here as if the only thing that had existed here was long gone. Breathing in through his nose, Ash slowly let air out through his mouth. Only a bit more, and I can call it quits. Get a job and just... live. No more school, no more elders, no more limb, Ash said, his mouth screwing up into a bitter grimace. Shaking his head, Ash did his best to quickly dispel the negativity he just dumped on himself. It would do him no good to bring it here. Here, where he sought the quiet. An escape. William D. really brings home the bacon on this bad boy's back. This was a bit of fun storytelling, and, and I keep having Last Dragon flashbacks uh, as I listen to this book. I mean, you, you want to know something? I'm, I'm a big fan of kung fu movies, um, and Last Dragon is my favorite. And there's just certain things that I compare this to uh, here, and it, this was a fun story. I kept seeing Bruce Leroy a couple times here. Um, this is a companion piece to Asgard Awakens, but it is also a completely separate story that only ties in with Corbin's books tangently, uh, tangentially, I should say. Um, this is a, a very good thing. It's very good uh, as it has a, its own flavor. And, and let me tell you, it's very different from Asgard. Uh, both of the books are very distinct in their settings. Believe me, you will not confuse one for the other if you were to walk into a room uh, and you said, this room is Cultivating Chaos and the room over there is uh, Asgard Awakens. You would know the difference in style and texture and art and uh, everything about it. Uh, the design would be very telling. And there's no doubt that these are different worlds, uh, but they are connected by a door, by a doorway, uh, by those veils. And, and I have to say... Uh, that I am a huge fan of Iran's, and we'd be, to say that, it would be just a complete understatement if I just said I'm a huge fan. But I've never read a book of his that I have not utterly loved. Uh, and that goes for Fostering Faust. I know that is one of the more controversial books out there, 
but I enjoyed Fostering Faust a lot. Um, I would be hard-pressed to pick a favorite of his. Truthfully, I mean truthfully, I would have to say that Super Sales uh, is my go-to Rand book or series or however you want to put it. But this book is one hell of a close second. I freaking grew up watching Chop Saki and Godzilla flicks as a kid. Just grew up watching them. And I can say Chop Saki because... That was the era I grew up in, and those were what they were known for. Uh, and I don't think it's a negative stereotype. I think it's actually an honor to have something titled like that uh, because these these movies just inspired me as a kid. I mean, I did martial arts for years uh, because of movies like this. Um, I, I was inspired literally by one of the movies I'm going to name here in a minute because my dad would, would always poke fun at me because I could sit at home and watch Rio Bravo, and then turn around and watch the most perfect, the 36th chamber of the Shaolin. He would say, I did a Western and an Eastern back to back. Okay. That is how much, uh, you know, this stuff was a part of my life because the 30th, 36th chamber of the Shaolin was the movie that if you ever watch Kill Bill, and he's like, oh, I've carried buckets of water up and down those stairs, you know, so many times, you know, it just makes my arm hurt just looking at him. Um, here, this is the movie where, you know, the guy, he carries those buckets of water up those steps. He has his arms out straight. He has the bands with the knives so that if he, he drops it a little bit, he gets stabbed, and he has to keep his arms up. Uh, and he gets to be so, so hardcore at it. Eventually, he's just running up and down those steps like nothing. And he's actually stopping people from falling. He puts his foot up and grabs a guy's butt with his foot and keeps him balanced and keeps him pushes him up the stairs. Um, that movie is amazing. Uh, and this is the way it felt to me in this book. Um, I really, really kept saying to myself, this is the 36th chamber all over again. Uh, so, you know, I actually have some anime background. Uh, it's very limited. I mean, I could talk, probably tell you, um, I've got three three animes that I've watched and I, I'm dedicated to. And there's others, but um, Naruto, Inuyasha, Cowboy Bebop. Okay, uh, so as limited as it is, I had to laugh when Iran literally rips on Naruto, and, and, and there's this whole shout out to the I'm going to yell what I'm going to do and use my hand signs. Uh, you know, and, and as I do this. You know, you just punch me and take me out. Um, it just cracked me up. It was just really, really funny. But I do take a little umbrage as he also takes a pot shot at Super Sales and Felix. Um, and while they're his characters to make fun of as he likes, I'm going to take a little umbrage here and say, hey, don't mess with Felix. Don't crack a joke at his expense. All right, got that off my chest. As things go, this is a typical and not in a bad way, a Rand book insofar as the hero kind of stumbles onto a way to make himself stronger and then quickly builds a harem. Uh, this is not the Fostering Faust style of harem, but it is a harem nonetheless. It's not that hardcore. Uh, in fact, I, I really can't think of other than them saying, here's what we're going to do, being much more than a fade to black before the scene starts kind of thing. Now, one thing that I have noticed is that, and I'm, uh, again, I'm, I'm not being negative here. I'm just making an observation. William D. Aran does sort of replicate his harem girl's personalities over and over again in each book. Um, you know, what I mean by that is, is you, you always will have like this no nonsense, nose to the grindstone person. There'll be the secretive one. Uh, there'll be the admirer. There's the slightly dangerous one or the one that's just a little bit of whacked out of her mind. Um, he just kind of like, shuffles their quirks to and fro a little bit to make new characters, but there's always that that archetype, so to speak, for his ladies. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. If you, if you think I'm wrong, call me out on it. But I think that that's what he does. Because, like, to me, um, there are parts uh, where I was listening to this and I was thinking of uh, you know, the pancakes from Super Sales, there's Andy. And then, you know, you go through it, you, you'll see who I'm talking about. I go back to the Selfless Hero trilogy, uh, you know, for the, the Admirer and that sort of thing. If you pay attention, you'll see it's pretty much the same set of chicks, and I'm not being rude when I say that, uh, the same babes, the same ladies, 
uh, just names are changed and personalities maybe get kicked around a little bit or there's some weird stuff going back and forth, but it's the same ones. Um, and that's okay. I mean, you can only do so many girls and you've got to keep track of who they are, what they do. And I think you kind of, uh, ease into it and just say, here's what it's going to be. Um, it's easier that way than trying to come up with, you know, 48 different women styled women. It works. It it really does. And and I have to say that, you know, are there that many personalities out there that are so different? I don't think so. Um, anyway, anyway, there is some crossover between the girls as far as I'm concerned. That is just my observation. Uh, the MC Ash has access to a hall of records, um, that he finds that sort of lets him bestow abilities upon himself and others. And he gets his wish to become a cultivator. Finally, finally, he had to wait. He had the means to do it. He just could not get his, his, his self open enough to do it. Um, and he ends up joining the school of his dreams. Uh, he then sets about getting into one hell of a feud with some big community bigwigs. Uh, and this really complicates his life because feuds, as you know, they very rarely ever end well for either side. Uh, and as tough as, as, as Ash is, there are complications for what he's doing. Uh, so, you know, the, the, this is a seriously epic struggle. And, and the story itself and the characters and the action all kept me hooked. Uh, I really like to know what Aran's secret is. Because the man just pens one awesome story after another. And the only thing that really struck me about this book was that it's about five hours longer than Corvin's. Um, Corvin's book stopped right as it was building up to something really compelling. I mean, it was like, I'm at the crest, and I'm going to stop right here so you want to come back later. Uh, It made me have to wait for more. Okay, uh, This book added five more hours, and I still wanted more. So I don't care how much they write. I'm going to be a one mo, okay? That's all there is to it. Um, you, they could write 24 hours. They could write 48 hours, um, you know, because Shemner Cousin, it's, he, he is the guy that will write 22, 23, 24-hour books. And as soon as he's done with that, um, after I've finished that book, I'm like, okay, where's the next one? Come on, kick it out. Let's go. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and, and it's the same thing with the two of them. I think Blaze just kind of has, this is where I want myself to stop point. And it really feels like a natural and organic stopping point. With William, uh, he kind of goes into, I want to tell all this that I can right here because I've got more stuff that I need to get in the next book. And I can't have this stuff taking up room from there. So, you know, he gets it all out. He tells you everything you need to know in this story. Uh, and, and it's fun. I really enjoyed Ash a lot. And I don't want to say I liked him better than I did Trav. I think they're both interesting characters, but um, for me, I am like I said, I, I ho 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 ho. Everybody was kung fu fighting, yeah. Those cats were fast as lightning. That's where I go, you know. That is my home, you know. Uh, I have to say, you know, that there are times when you know I just have to break out in that that song. Uh, just because it, I am a Kung Fu fighter. Uh, and, and, you know, that, this book made me want to sing. It made me want to go back, back and watch the 36th Chamber. It made me want to watch The Last Dragon. Uh, just brilliant movies, you know, just everything about this stuff. It, it, it was just very much in tune with the subject matter. Very much in tune with it. I don't think you could have done any better trying to get there. Uh, he, he, he tags a lot of things that needed touched on and it's a really brilliant homage. It really is. Now, now here, <laughs> here is the part where I get to talk about Andrea. Uh, again, Andrea, she just, just drives these stories forward. Like she is on a bobsled being pushed down a hill by an avalanche. She gives everybody a very distinct personality and quirks in her vocalizations, and I cannot think of anybody else doing this series. Uh, the only other thing I really wonder about, and I've got to bring this up, Andy, I'm sorry, is the leads. Um, I've listened to both books back to back, one right after the other, and I honestly, I could not tell if you used a different voice 
for each of the main characters or not. If they were close to one another, to me, they both sounded about the same. Ash and Trav, side by side comparison, I would probably say they sound very much alike. And if they are not, I'm very sorry about that. My hearing is apparently not able to discern that. Um, but it was like the de facto male lead voice came out for both of them. Um, and, and they just sounded about the same as one another. Um, and that would be fine normally, but as these two characters are looking for each other, there's a possibility they're going to meet sometime. And I don't know how you would pull that off if they both have the same voice. Because if they do meet and they do get face-to-face, which I hope happens because it needs to happen, there needs to be some sort of closure for these people, um, I think you would have a bit of a rough time because then you'd have to swap one of those up. You'd have to change one somewhere. And I'm not sure if I'm correct in this or not, but I think that was the case. I, I think it was. And, and again, I really understand that you could get away with that in any other circumstance, but here, because this, <laughs> this is the veil verse and characters are going to step into other people's books from time to time. I think, I don't know who's going to write what, but I can almost guarantee you that Trav and Ash are going to meet in a face-to-face confrontation sometime in the future. It might be three books from now, but it will have to happen. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, you could do it a whole lot differently and it's still going to be great. Um, you know, you just, you, you knocked these two books out of the park, Andrea. And, and, and that was like the only thing. If I had to say, what did I get out of it? That would be the only craziness because everything else about this was spot on. Perfect as always. I, I, I'm always blown away by your ability, your talent, uh, the emotion that you convey into your stories, your characters. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard like a bland character or a an, an uninteresting, an uninteresting character come out of your mouth. I think that you've managed to make even the most simple characters have more life to them than they should. You know, because there's always going to be throwaway characters, background characters, characters you'll never see again, um, and. You always give everybody like a voice as if they were going to be in the next book. You know, they're not a throwaway character. They're going to be here. They're going to be big the next book. Next book, this guy who's out there selling newspapers, he's going to become the newspaper titan of the world. And they're going to have to go talk to him and get some information. So you do it like that. And and I'm always impressed by that. But I did think that, you know, the two MCs were about the same vocally, and I had to bring that out. Um, again, just because I, I kind of get worried about what you're going to do if they do have a face-to-face, uh, which is a possibility. Uh, anyway, you know, don't take that as a negative. This book is really fun. It's really great. Andrea is amazing, as always. She carries this. And I'm just going to say this right up front. I don't care... Like I said before, um, the, the the concept, the, the series itself, this is going to be a great gateway for other authors to come in and create their own worlds to connect to your stuff. And if you do that, I, I just want to say this. This needs to be a one voice kind of thing. Andrea is the person that should be the one voicing the Veilverse books. It should be a one voice person doing this um to mix it up in any other way it would just not work i don't think it would be as uh it would not be as, as uh trademark so to speak in my mind you know no copyright or whatever you want to put it um but she's your brand you, know, you want to talk about brands andy is the brand for the veil verse okay uh she is the one that really brought life to these characters all the way straight down the line, brought life to everybody, whether it was Trav or Ash or any of the girls, she she brought this place to life vividly in both books. Very impressive how she did that. And I think that to put anybody else in would be just a, a really bad idea because she's the stamp of this universe right now. And yep, yep, you can you can swap it up and change it out and do a lot of things and, and you can get away with it and it won't be bad. But I think Andy, you know, Andrea really, really did something special here. Uh, not that, you know, the writers didn't, but Andrea really, really 
put herself into this book and into these characters. And to overlook that because somebody else comes in and says, you know, I, I like uh, this person or that person. That's great. But we're going to stick with Andy because she is our voice for the Melvers. Uh, I just think that's the way it should be because she really carries this whole thing. As great as the books are, it, they're even better with her there. Final score for this version, Cultivating Chaos. I got to give it an 8.5. It's going to be one point more just because I'm a Chop Saki fan. And as much as I say later on here in the show, if you watch, I'm going to talk about how I have to set things aside and, and focus on like the, the the important parts of it. If it's something I don't like, I kind of say, okay, this is just something I've got to overlook and look at what the basics are, how good this other stuff is, and, and put aside the way I feel about things. I really feel 100% there's no one else could do this, um, and and Andrea did it, but because because this is dealing with something I love, the kung fu stuff. The kung fu stuff is it is who I am in my soul. Um, you know, years uh, I didn't do kung fu. I did did taekwondo, but martial arts are martial arts, and when you do them. Uh, even if you don't do it for 10 years, if you're not out there doing it every day and then practicing and doing your kata and things, it's still a part of your life and it carries over with you in everything you do. It's like, it, I guess it's kind of like being in the military. You know, you may not be in the military, but you are in the military. Um, and I can say that because I'm an army brat and my dad, my gosh, he, he's not been in the military for years, but he still acts like he is, still acts like it. Um, and so because of the subject matter alone, I've got to give it just a point more, just a point more, just a point more than the Asgardian book. As much as I hate to say that, so I'm going to say 8.5 stars, length, character, action, narration, and concept was just one hell of a leg sweep for me and knocked me over. But the subject matter really won me in the end. So, yeah, I mean, the, the subject matter was just awesome. Um, and, and like I said, I've actually been looking to see if there are like Chinese or Japanese or Korean lit RPG books out there. And everybody keeps telling me, go find Wuxia. Uh, is that right? Is that how you say that? Wuxia? Wuxian? Waka? 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 Um, whatever it is. And I actually have one that I, I would have done this week um, as a, is it lit? But I wanted to do Annalise Rennie's stuff first. So next week, you'll probably get unsold in the uh, Is It Lit category. Um, but yeah, 8.5 stars. 8.5 stars. Just because, you know, one point more. Just because I'm, I'm a kung fu kind of guy. Okay, so the next book I'm going to be reviewing for you today is The Halloween Raid. A game lit short story. Hmm, maybe. Maybe we finally found something good. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, by George Solidus. Uh, narrated by Dave Price with a length of 55 minutes. And that really qualifies it as a real, total, complete short story. The Raiders have been calling it hardcore mode. It's a gaming term. It means you only get one chance. If you die in the pumpkin, you get blinked outside and denied further entry. Forever. So many have tried to get back inside, only to fail. But the creepy thing is that one in a thousand deaths is permanent. Or, at least, the raider goes missing, never to be seen again. Some say the aliens grab them. Some that they fertilise the soil inside. What's certain, so far is that one in a thousand raiders that die never come back. How do we know those numbers? Because millions have already fallen, and the statistics are accurate down to the last one. So, you know, I am always griping about wanting a good lit RPG short story. I enjoy short stories a lot, and I never can find anything in the lit RPG realm of short stories. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think the closest that you get are like maybe a novella here or there from like Blaze Corvin or something along those lines, which is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I, I really appreciated, you know, The Secret of the Old Ones by Blaze Corvin, uh, but it's a novella. And I, I really want like just a, a nice, 
I would love an anthology of short stories, and I have one from the folks over in Russia that I plan on checking out. But what I want to do is I want to actually read some of the series that the books have these short stories from so that I have a better idea of what I'm reading. I don't want to just go into a cold and be like, it was a good story, but I had no clue what was happening. I want to know the characters or I want to know the premise or the setting and that sort of thing. So that book will be coming soon after I kind of get into the other series of those other authors. But I've always been looking for like a good lit RPG short story. Uh, and I, you know, I, I've come close a couple times. There's been a couple that have been, yeah, you know, not, not quite there. Like the, the one by Calico Jack, the pirate, it, it, it had a lot of potential. And it, to me, it felt like a first chapter more than it did a short story. It really just, it kind of felt like this is the, it's, a, it's either a prelude or a, a setup or it's a first chapter. One of those things, it was one of those three things. It did not feel like a short story to me, even though that's what it was claimed to be. So I've been looking for a good lit RPG short story. So there are really two drawbacks that I have when it comes to this audio. And I hate to even say it like that. Um, and the first hat, I have to be realistic. I mean, like, are you willing, and I, I have to think about this now, are you really willing to spend $3 on a 55-minute story? Okay, here's the thing. I am. I am. Um, I mean, I mean, hell, I spend more money on that for a comic book, and I hate to say it like that. I spend way more money on a comic book that I'll probably read in under ten minutes or less. And yes, I can go back and re-peruse the comic and uh, admire the art and all that. But I read the story. A comic book usually takes me ten to fifteen minutes at most, depending on how much I really, really, really try to absorb the story and the action and the words and that sort of thing. It's not not something that, you know, you've got heavy paragraphs from Faulkner that you're trying to absorb uh, and, and digest. It, it's it's fun and it's great. Um, but most people, and I know that's one of those things that like Ramon, when you watch his show, he'll talk about like, you know, the book's only like 180 pages. Is it worth the $4 that you're going to spend the three ninety nine or the two ninety nine? And I have to agree with him on that. So this is one of those things I'm just going to lay it out here right now. It's a $3 audiobook and I think it's a three dollar short story. Uh, now that's where I would say I, I can understand a three dollar audio um, for the ebook I kind of have issues with because uh, I, I have short stories out on Amazon and they're 99 cents and that's to just buy them outright for your book. I, I've got them on the Kindle Unlimited for free. So uh, you know three dollars for a short story that I know is not that long. Mm. But, I mean, hell, like I say, it is what it is. So, my opinion is, if it's good, it's justified. All right? So, now we're have to decide, is this a good short story? Uh, the only other thing is, is that this is, is it, is it lit RPG? I guess is the best way to ask us. Because the the story is not, I, I guess I, I should put it like this, it is not uber crunchy. There, there's just no way it can be. Uh, because it's a very short story. It's 55 minutes. So you're not going to get a lot of crunch. You know, you're not going to get grape nuts. You're not going to get a bite of grape nuts. You're going to kind of get a bowl full of mush, which is, is okay. You know, not everything has to be heavy with numbers and heavy with alerts and notifications and that sort of thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I will say this is lit RPG. Uh, it definitely has the touch, but it's a light touch. I mean, just choop. A little bit because you can't squeeze a whole lot into the story and make it a short story under an hour. It's just impossible. So you've got to juggle the balls and see where it goes. And I think George, uh, he, he did a pretty good job here. Uh, the, the story, it's got everything you want. It's got setup, it's got the tension in, in the center, and it's got the ending. And the ending left me wanting more. Okay. So, you know, there you go. I'm just giving that all out there right now. So fair warning, don't get under hot under the collar and yell at me and say, hey, I spent all this money and it's not dense with stats and it was, it was three bucks and it was 55 minutes and I, I felt like I was ripped off. That's that's why I'm giving you all these caveats right up front. Right up front because um, it's unfair to not give you a kind of a, a heads up. Um, now, I've been listening and reading, I have to say this right off, out from the gate, to George's stuff for some time. Um, I have to say that one of my favorite short stories uh, that I've ever read is called You Have Too Many Friends by him. Uh, it is really short. I mean, honestly, if you go to Audible and you look it up, You Have Too Many Friends, it's 20 minutes long. 20 minutes. 
so it's not overly long, but it's very memorable. I mean, honestly, it, it carried a lot of weight and it has stuck in my head since I've listened to it. It is one of those stories that I think about because of the implications of what happened in the tale. It was a really good, I, I would almost put it like a Twilight Zone kind of film kind of story, uh, maybe Outer Limits, but, but but it was all normal. There was no sci-fi. There was no supernatural aspects to it, but it was just creepy as hell, and it worked so well. The Halloween raid, in comparison, holds its own. I have to say it holds its own. I don't think it has the depth that the other story had, uh, but the other story was like a real punch in the face. It was quick. It was over with, and, and it was like, pow, you, it was done. So, you know, this one has a bit more of a layout. It's got more of a story. It's got characters to it besides the two that were in the one that I just told you about. Um, so let me kind of tell you about the story. The story is 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 pretty simple. Uh, a, a lot of things go unanswered, as they should in a short story. Uh, short stories, you should not know everything that's going on, everything that's happening. You should be left wondering things. That's the wonder of a short story. Uh, because you question why things happen. It makes you think about aspects of life and that sort of stuff. So basically, you are left to make some conclusions. Um, in the story, once a year, a giant jack-o'-lantern pops up in either Europe or the U.S. It swaps out either year. You know, if it's in the U.S. last year, this year it's in Europe. Um, so every year around Halloween, that's when this thing pops up. Inside of the jack-o'-lantern is where all the gamey stuff happens. Um, so people outside are able to just walk into the pumpkin and they will fight monsters and get loot. And that's what the whole premise is about is... Um, this has been going on for a while, and certain gamers, uh, the people that go in, they'll live stream everything that's happening. They'll show you like the monsters they're fighting and the loot they get, and, and you can bring back a pretty good haul. I mean, really easily uh, from just a few hours working there. Uh, the bad news is, is that the the pumpkin, no one knows where it comes from. Uh, there's speculation that it's aliens. And the real, real problem is that the game that is inside the pumpkin is set on hardcore level. Now, in hardcore level, basically, um, if you die in the pumpkin, you can never go back in. You're banned for life. No retries, no restarts, no resets. You're, you're done and you're out and you're over with. You can't go back in. But just one more little catch to the whole thing. Um, Oof. The bad news, bad news, the really bad news bears, is that about one out of every thousand people who go into the pumpkin and get killed just disappear. They don't respawn outside. No one knows what happens to them. People think the aliens took them. They're being experimented on. They don't know. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. It's never revealed. It's one of those things that you have to decide for yourself, uh, which is really fine. I have my suspicions of what I think it would be. You'll have yours. Um, but no one knows what happens to these people. So they're basically considered as being dead and people move on. The real problem comes that the MC, the main character, his brother, now the MC is Edward, um, his brother goes in year after year and he's the only reason why they survive from year to year uh, and they're not out on the street and they're not starving because he pulls in enough loot with his little team uh, to keep his family afloat. And this is the year Edward is going to go into the pumpkin. And right before he leaves, his mother says, no, I don't want you going this year. I want you to stay out and just, you know, cheer on your brother. So he obeys his mother very sadly. And he goes to a bar and he watches his brother's live feed. And horrible, horrible things happen. And he watches his brother get killed in the pumpkin. He's very nearby. So he runs down to the pumpkin patch, which is where you kind of respawn, and his brother's not there. So from that point, he has to go into the pumpkin because he figures um, if his brother is never coming back because he's out of his whole team, he's the only one that didn't show back up. He's got to get some loot in order to keep his mother from like being booted out in the street and they have food to eat for the year. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And <clears throat> Edward... Is is a, is a interesting character. Um, he's one of these people that he has studied this his whole life. He's watched the video feeds. He's listened to people talk about it hour after hour. I mean, he has prepared, and he kind of runs in after all this preparation. 
with no weapon, no gears. I mean, nothing. There, there's no gear there. Um, he just kind of just goes in willy nilly and he, he doesn't think about what he's doing. So, you know, he, he just wants to get in, grab some loot and hope he doesn't get killed and have to respawn. The problem is, is that the lit stuff, which I'm not going to tell you about, all appears in the pumpkin. But it is there. Uh, it is there. He does gain a couple class titles and some levels and, you know, stuff like that. It's really pretty interesting. It was a fun story. Um, I can't say that this is like one of the best lit RPG stories I've ever read. I've read a lot of lit, lit RPG. Um, I'm not going to say that it's it's close to all that. It's a really good story. Um, and I think it is a worthwhile short story for what it is. I think it's really, really excellent in, in what it is. And I think that there's a really good setup for the story itself for more to come in the future. And I would really like to see, you know, um, maybe another longer novella. Because George does those a lot. He's got, a, you know, several novellas that he really fleshes out in his his little universe that he's created. And I'm trying to think of what it's called right off the top of my head. And I know it won't come until later on after I'm all done with this. Um, but um, he, he he sets it up really nicely at the end so that you could have more to the story. And, and that's one of the great things about it. The story did not go the way I expected it to. There was just, I just kind of figured, okay, this is what's going to happen to Edward. And that's going to be the, oh, we got you kind of deals. And that is not what happened. That is not what happened at all. It was it was a nice way to end the story and leave it open for more later. Uh, Dave Height, Dave Heiss, Dave Price handles the narration. Narration. Love, two love. I can't talk today. Dave Price handles the narration pretty well, uh, and he provides a lot of voices and attitude in each of the characters. I, I think the only off fleek moment. Yes, I do have teenagers, and I'm learning these things. Um, was when the witch would speak. Um, it was a little corny, but even as corny as it was, it worked. I think I think he did a good job. Uh, everything else was was right down the line. I'm gonna give it a seven point eight. I really enjoyed this. I, I don't know if you're going to um, want to swing, you know, triple Georges for a listen. You know, three bucks. Um, it was it was worth it for me. It was fun. I think you'll like it. Um, and if you're looking for a short story with lit RPG elements, this is the place to start. I am going to look for more. I will always be looking for more. But this is probably, uh, and I know right now it's not probably, it's the only short story i found so far that did not leave a bad taste in my mouth and I actually enjoyed and, and was happy with at the end. Uh, and like I say, um, Dave Price does a nice job on the narration. Um, it's, it's just, it was a little too light for me to go all out and go, you know, Hey, this is going to be a higher score, but that's fine. This was still a really, really good short story. 7.8 stars. Okay. So I haven't done this for a few episodes. I've been trying to get around and there's, there's several people I want to get to in this category. Um, but I'm going to do a, what else have they done today segment? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, feature Annalise Srenny. Yeah. Yeah. She's got another book coming out real soon. Uh, it's going to be at the end of the month. In fact, I think that by the time this show airs, the newest book that she has will be released. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. Um, but we're going to be talking about Futures Orphans, the Ouroboros Cycle Series, book two, narrated by A.K. I'm not sorry. It is not narrated by A.K. Alice. It is Written by A.K. Alice. Narrated by Annalise Rennie. Okay. I told you I was spotlighting her on this, didn't I? And I'm going to just tell her that she's not even narrating the book. It's the writer doing it. Uh, the, with the book length of seven hours and 34 minutes. Can't. She blinks down at him. Have to. Come this far. Be not far to go. Paco speaks the truth, but a fall from this height will still cause their ending. He begins clambering over the broken ladder sections once more, heading towards where it becomes more serviceable. Above them, the rain had stopped, the clouds shifting to reveal the moon bright and pale overhead. It picks out a shallow stream of water at the base of the ladder, running in a narrow strip. 
It shines pallid and moves swiftly between banks of smooth gray stone. Studying it, he realizes that the angled sections are man-made. If they follow its path, they might come to the exit of the gorge and perhaps still manage an escape. Cass finally relents her grip, taking it slowly, and he stops, waiting for her to clear the damaged section of ladder. Her labored breathing provides more of an indicator to her progress than her black-clad form in the soft wash of moon. When I was trying to figure out, like, who to do next, and I've got, I swear to God, I've got four other authors that I want to get to, and about four other narrators, um, I, I was talking with Annalise Rennie on Facebook. She was going back and forth about, about something on air, and I said, I got to do Annalise I got to spotlight her. She is a huge part of this community. Um, she has done Lit RPG. She's got Lit RPG coming out. I really need to just kind of get people more aware of Annalise. So, you know, I said, I'm going to do this. And it's funny because I'm always curious. Like, if you ever go on Audible, you'll see, like, this book is unavailable. This book is unavailable in a series. And it will tell you, like, ask me why. And it'll ask you, know, ask it why I don't. It won't give you an answer. It just gives you some bull crap. Um, it doesn't give you like, well, the author doesn't want this book released at this point. It just tells you stupid crap. Um, so I'm always curious when I see like a book in a series that is on Audible, but it's not the starter book. It could be book three, book four, book two, but you'll have like book one will be totally written and it's on Amazon, not on Audible. Uh, so... That it kind of throws me off, and 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 this is what we do. We have book two, book two, not book one, with no book one coming in on the horizon of Audible at all, as far as I could tell. So I just have to run with it and figure there's a reason. There's a reason. Uh, I don't know what it is. It could be internal strife. It could be heartbreak. Whatever the reason, I'm gonna just take it for what it's worth and say I don't need book one to know what's happening in book two. And and that's pretty much the case here. I, I can't believe I need any setup from a previous book to know anything about what's happening in book two. Book two is pretty much a self-contained story. Uh, from start to finish, it, it, it is perfectly fine all by itself up on a shelf. You can just take it down and read it and be done with it and put it back. And you don't have to say, what started this whole ball rolling? You don't need that at all. It's a standalone. And I would almost say that the way it would look to me would be, Books one, book three, four, whatever's coming, they're kind of all set in the same um, place, in the same universe, but they're probably not going to all have the same characters. Just reasons for that. So uh, <clears throat> two things that I want to get off my chest, and I like to do this first and out of the way, um, I, I, like I just did with the, the little RPG short story I, I was telling you about. I, I came clean in the beginning and said, here are my concerns. Okay, two things I have to come forward with right away uh, that, for me, right off the bat, were issues. First, the book is told in present tense. I have a very difficult time reading present tense stories, let alone listening to them. In fact, there's an author who is very well loved in the community, and and no, it's not the peop the person, one of the people that everybody has issues with. Um, this is a well known, well liked author. I can't read their stuff or listen to it because they write in present tense and it's not Ramon. Um, I didn't even know Ramon wrote that because I just watched a, a podcast with him the other day where he was talking to people and he's like, well, there are people that I, I know that they won't even listen, read my stuff because it's, it's all written in you know, first person present or whatever. And they go look at it and they go, Nope. And that's fine. Uh, because they can't handle that sort of stuff. And I'm one of those people. And I've always wanted to, I've, I've always wanted to go. And even if I don't review the books, I want to read or listen to Ramon's stuff just out of respect. I, I think that, you know, he does, he's a really well liked author. Uh, he's, he's a great reviewer. And I think I should kind of, kind of get a feel for who the, who he is as a, as an author as well as, as a reviewer. And I, after I found that out, I was like, well, I'm glad I haven't done that yet because I don't know what I would say afterwards. Cause I don't want to say, Hey, I, I wanted to read your stuff. I just, I didn't get around to it because I don't like the way it's written. I won't do that. So I, I will read it. I will get to them. Um, but I may not, not ever talk about it just because I can't say – the way I look at it is I have to be able to say as a reviewer when I review a book, there are going to be things about a book I don't like. It may be a subject topic. It may be a writing style. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example okay, of writing style. Um, back when I was still reading books because I had time – um, 
one of the series that came out that I really wanted to read was Sandman Slim. Uh, and I got the book and I was like, this is going to be great. I've heard so much good things. I'm a huge urban fantasy fan. And I opened the book up and I read about two pages and I was like, oh dear God, oh dear God, what, what have I gotten myself into? Because the writing is, it's choppy and it, it is just, it is all over the place. It, it, it just does not make sense to me as I read it. It, it is not a normal thing. And when I started doing audio, I thought, well, I'll give it a try. How bad can it be with somebody reading it? Maybe they can do it. And the narrator of that series totally gets and understands and nails the heart of the story. He carries the story. I couldn't read it as a book. Could not. I mean, I would have went back and read it eventually just because I started it. And even two pages, I had. I would have this OCD thing about not finishing it. But it might have been 20 years from now, but I'd have still finished the book. But I was able to do that because the narration was so fantastic. And I kind of hope that that's what's going to be, you know, with like Ramon Mija when it comes to that. But I, I have to say, I have to compartmentalize that. Okay, I've got to say, I don't like this. I, I might not like, let's just say, for example, I may not like a, a drug addiction in a story. And a story is completely about drug addiction. I have to be able to say, as much as I hate drug addiction... I still thought this was a well-written story. I think it was a, a smartly written story. It was it was a very well-crafted story. So while my initial stomach-wrenching reaction tells me to give it a low score, um, I have to say I can't do that. I can't even let my emotions about how this is affect me. I have to look at it clinically and say, how was this if I just came in cold and had no feelings on this whatsoever. How did it make me feel? So that's what I did here. I, I said, okay, I'm going to step back. I, I, I wanted to do this for Annalise uh, just because she, she's a great person. She does a lot of stuff in the community, for the community, asks nothing from anybody. I, I said she deserves this spotlight. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, boop, it's present tense. Uh, just get out of my way. I am going to knock this out of the park. I'm going to just, just go for it. I'm just going to go for it and do it. So I hit it. And the other thing I need to talk to you about is that the beginning of the book is very slow. Oh, so slow. Pretty slow, in fact. It's, it's pretty slow. Now, here's the thing. I'm okay with slow so long as there is a payout in the long run. I can understand that you have set up and there's things you've got to do. There's info dumps. There's characters that have to be introduced. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. And I am willing to overlook slow stuff. And if you know anything, if you've listened to me, you know I'll tell you the slowest book that I have ever read was The Sword of Shannara. It is this thick, and if it was that thick, it would have been a brilliant book. Because it is this much crap that does not need to be told. It's stylized. It's verbose. And it is just boring. There's just nothing to it. If you'd have condensed it down, edited it, man, it would been a great, amazing story. Elfstones was this thick, and it blows the Sword of Shinar out of the water. And so... I can get through setup. I really can. It may take me a little bit of time, but I can get through setup. But I have to tell you here and now, the book doesn't take off like a race car in the red. Okay? Just to give you that, excuse me, give you that right out of the gate. Because it's not fair for you to say, um, this book was, I was anticipating a lot of action and things like that. And that's not the way it is. It's, it's, it's a very dystopian future. Uh, the characters are, uh, broken people. Uh, it's centered around two characters. I should say that right off the bat, a junkie journalist named Cass and a street punk named Paco. Okay. Um, and it seems that the spit has really hit the fan in the world and, and the world is just barely getting by, just barely getting by the government is controlling people with dermal patches. Uh, the patches control their emotional states, uh, but the populace, they believe they need it to survive, and here it is. It's controlling them because they're addicted. Um, 
you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's this whole big mess. It's very, very uh, shadowy government kind of stuff. And all that has to get laid out. So don't anticipate, you know, because you got to figure out why is the main character a junkie? What happened? What happened that, that caused them to fall from being a, a brilliant journalist into being, you know, in, in the bowels of hell every day? You have to get all that. And you just don't do that inside of five pages. It just does not come about. Not in a good story. So, like I say, the story does start off a little slow. Now, needless to say, stuff happens. And before you know it, the pair, Paco and Cass, um, they're up to their necks in it. Okay, that's the best way I can do it. So when I said it started slow, it did just that. But once the initial setup was over... The book began to gather some steam, okay? And I mean, it was gathering steam until it was flying along like a Zeppelin that had jet boosters, okay? A lot of stuff happens, but it's really just about the journalist and the street kid keeping each other going that kind of steals the show. Um, yes, there are mysteries and betrayals that occur, and, and the pair are hounded by a mercenary. Um, I'm getting texts from... Facebook while I'm doing this. Um, but there are mercenaries that, that you know, that, that are hunting them down. Um, even the post-apocalyptic setting takes a backseat to the relationship that the pair have. And I don't say that in a negative way. I, I think that character growth and character development and character interaction is essential to an amazing story. Uh, everything else is really just window dressing if you look at it. Because if you don't have interesting characters or interesting, you know, developments... It doesn't matter, you know, where they're doing it. They can be doing it in Neverland. They can be doing it in hell. They can be doing it in outer space. And it's still going to be boring as crap. Um, here, they've got really great characters. And there's a lot of this, this stuff that's going on. And the story itself has, you know, it says, oh, it's got elements of Mad Max and Blade Runner. And, and it maybe, you know, it, it does. It does. I can see that. I can see that pretty clearly. But I can also see The Road by uh, Cormac McCarthy. And even some Philip K. Dick influences as well. I mean, you know, there's just a lot goes going on in this story. And it's got this feel of an original world that you're familiar with. If that makes any sense at all. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's strange how I, I connected to it after things started really going. And like I said, I did have to work my way past that tense issue. Uh, but I, I, I like I said, I, there's a lot of stuff that happens, and it's okay. I was able to uh, adjust my mental gears. I admit, I, if I stopped the book or put it down for a few minutes or came back to it an hour later, I had to get my brain geared back up to going into that way of speaking. Um, but that was it. That was the only thing. I just, I just took me a few minutes once we started the story back up. And I was back on the road. I was back there and I was enjoying the story. Now, I do, do, do want to talk about Annalise Rennie for just a minute since this is her spotlight uh, in the What Else Have They Done segment. Now, I, I first discovered, yeah, uh, I discovered Annalise Rennie. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, she she was doing uh, Achilles Reign, which is before the, the Puatera series online, um, which is by Dawn Chapman, the amazing Dawn Chapman. Hey, Don. Uh, she's a great lady. Um, anyway, she's since become it gets a huge part of the community. She does a lot of stuff for people, always, always building people up, uh, always, always helping out in any way that she can, and doing more books for the genre, genre every day. And I thought this would be her time to shine. So I want to just hand this back to her and say thank you for everything. Uh, the topics in this book hit on a lot of things. Uh, that actually pop up in lit RPG, so it's not really out of place. And you might want to look at her new upcoming audiobook, uh, The Song Maiden, a lit RPG, RPG journey. That should be popping up right about today, I guess, maybe tomorrow. I don't think it's yesterday, but I, I, it should be today or maybe tomorrow if you're watching this right now, right now, uh, if, if it's like a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday um, of the week. So, and I'm hoping she sings in it. I haven't. She hasn't told me. I don't. I don't talk to her that well. But I don't know her that well to say, "Hey, Dawn, you know, hey, Annalise, um, do you do you sing in that? Do you? Because you, you know, she does do a, a kick-ass Carpenter's version uh, of some stuff. Um, anyway, Rennie's style is really fantastic. I love listening to her. 
Um, and she paces her story and dialogue so well and provides distinct voices for each character um, that, that I have to say that that was part of what made me be able to get through the iffiness of the, the tense kind of issue that I have, you know, the present tense. I just, I can't do that. And her, her way of doing it, her cadence and her pace worked it well for me. Um, and I, I think that she slips into male voices pretty easily. I'm pretty impressed. You know, uh, Andrea Parsno does it, uh, you know, it, and I think I've talked about Andrea today enough, so I'm not going to go into it, but <laughs> sorry, Andy. Um, I think that Annalise does a really good job with the men voices as well as the others. Um, and, and she, I mean, you know, like I said, she's the only reason why I was able to get past that perspective, uh, because it rattled my cage. It rattled my cage a lot. And, and like I said, she made it just that little bit easier to swallow. She was my spoonful of sugar, spoonful of sugar. Uh, so even with the whole, whole slow setup uh, of the process. If it had been anybody else, I probably might have wanted to just drop the book altogether. Um, but Annalise really kept it on fleek. That's my second time today. I got to use that word for my son. Uh, she kept it on task, on point, however you want to word it, uh, so that you didn't drift away. Uh, and I think that, you know, and you won't be sorry. You really will not be sorry uh, going through this. With the way she does stuff, you know, like I said, I don't want to get scared off. It is a little slow, and if you have that issue with the tense, like I do, the present tense telling of the story, it, it may not be for you. But she really, really has a good grasp on the story. She has a, an utter concept of who these people are, and she puts it out there. There's emotion there. You know Paco, and you know the you know the, the journalist, the junkie journalist, and you, you feel sometimes I was like, um, has Annalise ever like you know shot up or something? Because she seems to get this character a little too well, and I and I speak from somebody who comes from a family with people who've died from drugs, so I can say that I can say that I don't think Annalise has ever done drugs, but I think that she understands um, how to convey that. I think that she can uh, emote. Their, their their feelings very well uh and and the issues that they have I, I think that you know this was one of those performances that you, you hear about all the time you know I talk about it with like the sambu theater people uh they have performances and i think annalise really really qualifies under that as well just like andy parsno um annalise really really just makes this her book and it's it's a good book it's enjoyable now as you know as I say this, um, I don't rate the what else have they done or the is it lit segments. I will only use books that I have enjoyed as a showcase. If I had listened to this and if Annalise had not done her magic and I felt that I didn't, didn't, I didn't like it, I wouldn't even review this book. Uh, you would never know that I had ever read it. Okay. That's just my first, here's how you know it's a good story. You're listening to it now. You're listening to me tell you about it right now. Um, you know, so it's like, that's, that's it. I have a showcase and, and I only use books that I enjoy. That's it. That's it. If it wasn't something that was fun, I wouldn't do it. For example, I have maybe a, another segment coming in a little while that I'm going to do, uh, in which I'll be rating the books normally because it, that would be more in line with little RPG stuff. And I don't want to just say, what else have they done or is it lit? This is going to be, this is connected to gaming. So I'm going to give these things scores. Um, but here, in this case, I never score these anymore. I started off, I think, the first one or two times and did it, and I thought, that's a bad idea because I'm just right now trying to introduce you to something else that these people have done, uh, things that are really fun or exciting or just different. Sometimes you can say, I like this person as a narrator, and I'm kind of just, I'm a little RPG person. You can, you can, you can kind of split away and get out of there for a little bit and, and enjoy life. Um, in the world with other stuff that they've done. You know, like I said, I, I've done it with Jeff Hayes, with the clan, um, with, with his, his one story that I told you about. Um, and I, I know I'm going to get it, but the, 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 where they're trying to kill the guy, the hit job or whatever it was called. And, and it, it's my memory. It's not that it wasn't good. It was a really good book, but those are the things that make you kind of grow as a listener, as a reader, uh, to kind of stretch a little bit. And so 
by doing this, you're you're still staying with the community, which is important, but you're also giving them a chance to shine and do other things because we can't do the same thing over and over again without losing our mind. Um, so I just wanted to give that to you. Um, if you really want to see scores, uh, go and check out the Audible book page because I'll have ratings on there for you. So hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. Go check that out. Uh, and you can see that on the audiobook page, probably about a day or so after this show is aired. Hmm. So get the book, listen to it, you'll enjoy it. Well, that's the show this week, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you all for watching. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch, to listen, and to support us. Um, you can, if you like, if you really like us and you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Facebook page. Uh, the, face, the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page, I should be more specific, or the YouTube page, just share and like the video. Uh, I, I just sincerely hope you've enjoyed our show. Uh, please leave comments or suggestions below. Uh, feel free to tell me whatever you like. I do enjoy the feedback. Remember, you can always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And like I said, I do have books on Royal Road. If you want to check those out, I'm not going to go and beat your head over with it. Um, it is just uh, Apocalypse on Endless Earths and Nightmare Game. So take those and, and give them a peek. Um, I just want to say, remember, the most important thing you can do for a book that you read is to leave a review. It is essential for authors to get reviews. So if you read it, whether you loved it or hated it or in between, leave a review and say why and how you felt about it. For the audiobook lit yeah, for the audiobook lit podcast. I think I'm getting lit. For the lit RPG audiobook podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.